Hello and welcome to Cross Life with your host, Pastor Bob Cornell. It's uh, so good to have you today. My wife is not here today, so uh, I'm here by myself, but I'm glad that you're watching. And today's program, I believe, is going to be a blessing for you. Uh, so I encourage you to watch the whole 30 minutes. It's going to be a help to you and your faith and your walk with the Lord. Uh, well, again, my name is Pastor Bob Cornell, pastor of Covenant Church in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. We'd love for you to check us out. You can see our ministry website on the uh, screen below. As well, you can check us out on Facebook, uh, Cornell Ministries Facebook page, as well, Cornell Ministries YouTube channel. Uh, there's so much that we do on our YouTube channel. Uh, we'd love for you to check us out, subscribe to our YouTube channel. I believe it will be a blessing to you. Well, in today's program, I'm going to be dealing with one of the most important subjects I believe there is for the child of God, especially in the day that we're living in and the time that we're living in, and that is the rapture of the church, the rapture of the church. There is, there is, especially with the pandemic that's gone on for the last little over a year and a half now, there have been so many thoughts about the end times. Are we living in the end times? Is this it? Is this the end of the age? Is, this the, is the world coming to an end? I've heard so many questions, and I've had those questions myself. And uh, uh, people have asked, are we in the tribulation period? Is the, is the Antichrist alive? And has, uh, uh, is Christ going to come soon? Questions like this. And because the, the world events like we've had in the last little over a year and a half with the pandemic, they stir up those type of questions, even in people who don't know Christ, who don't claim to be a follower of Jesus. Those questions are stirred up. Is the, is the world going to end? What's going to happen? You know, what, you know what? The Bible tells us what's going to happen in the end. The Bible tells us very clearly that and lets us know that this world, is, this earth is not going to be destroyed by climate change or by a nuclear bomb, uh, by World War III or IV or whatever. The world, this world's not going to be destroyed by those things. And you and I, as a, especially as a, as a child of God, we can, we can rest in that knowing that God has everything in control. He's not a puppet master up in heaven that's pulling the strings of, of everybody personally. No, God has given everyone a free will. That's why there is evil in this world because people reject God. They reject God's word. They reject Jesus Christ as the Son of God and what He accomplished at the cross. But I wanted to discuss today, again, that subject of the rapture. You know, the rapture of the church is, is, is a subject that has uh, been debated about for many, many years, and there are some who claim that there is no such thing as a rapture. There are some who uh, claim that the rapture is going to take place, it could take place at, at any time. We're going to talk about that today, when it's going to take place. Going to, uh, there are some who believe that the rapture uh, and the second coming of Christ are the same event. Uh, there are some who believe that we're going, to, we're going to, the church is going to go through the tribulation period and then we'll be raptured, or some who believe that at the midpoint of the tribulation period, all these questions about the rapture. But th there are some who claim that the rapture is not, is not even going to happen because you won't find the word rapture in the Bible. Let me, I'll just want to talk about that just briefly. Is that a valid, valid argument? The word rapture, they, some claim, is not found in the Bible. Therefore, the rapture is not even, not even real. Well, is it true? Yeah, it's true. Actually, the word rapture is not in the Bible. You won't find it in the Bible. But you know what? You won't find the word trinity in the Bible. You won't find the word commentary in the Bible. You won't find the word study Bible in the Bible. But yet it doesn't mean that those things are not valid or those things are not true. Just like the word rapture is an English word that really actually comes from a Latin word which comes from a Greek word. I know that they can, may be confusing, but that's where the English word comes from. It comes from a Latin word that comes from a, from a Greek word that we're going to look at uh, just briefly today. But the main concept of the rapture is found 
in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. Now, when I say it's mainly found, I, I say the, the, the word rapture or the word that we get the word rapture is from is from that passage, but it is all throughout the New Testament, the, the truth of the rapture of the church. But, what, but I want to give you real quickly, what does that mean? Because some don't know what the, what the rapture actually is. What does that mean, the rapture? Well, it is this. It is the literal physical coming of Jesus to suddenly take away everyone who has placed their faith of salvation in Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. The, the rapture is the literal physical coming of Jesus to suddenly take away all those, everyone who has placed their faith of salvation in Jesus Christ. That, in a nutshell, is what the rapture is. Now, in the rapture, as we'll see in just a moment, there is no evidence that the rapture in this literal physical coming of Jesus, that the world will ever see the rapture takes place. It's going to happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, as we'll see here. But I'm going to read out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. And if you have your Bibles, you can join together with me. But it's, this is what Paul writes. He says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. Let me stop right here. God does not want us to be ignorant about end time events or about what God is going to do in the future. Now, when I say that, it's impossible when I say that God does not want us to be ignorant about what's going to happen in the future. That doesn't mean that we know everything, all the details and every specific detail about the future. No, nobody does. But the main events that will happen in the future, God wants us to know those things. He does not want us to to be ignorant. You know, sometimes I've come across this in, in life and in ministry for many, many years. There are many believers and even pastors that take the attitude about the rapture and about end time events that, you know, they take the attitude of, oh, you know, nobody really knows. I, you, know, I, you know, end time events of the book of Revelation, I, you know, that's not really my thing. And again, nobody really knows and I don't understand it. So, I'm not going to talk about it. <clears throat> Get this. That's not what we see in the Word of God. That's not the way that Paul presented end-time events. That's not what the way that, that the end-time events is presented in the Bible. And the book of Revelation is not a book that some mystery book that no that we should have no that we you know have no clue about God didn't give us a book in the Bible in which is you know a, a mystery book there's there's we have no idea what it means <laughs> there is not a book in the Bible in which that is the case no the book of Revelation yes is a book that is full of symbolism of full of things that we that we true that we don't know but it's not a book that we just have no clue. No, God wants us to give us some understanding about what's going to happen in, in, of end time events. And Paul, that's why Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, again, beginning in verse 13, 13, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those things uh, who, or concerning those who have fallen asleep. That is, those believers, followers of Jesus, who have died, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Get this, we as believers, we don't have to sorrow like those who don't follow Jesus, those who don't believe in God. We don't, we don't have to sorrow like that as if it's all over, you know, your body just sits in the grave. No, 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 no. We as believers, we have a hope of heavenly glory, of a resurrected body. And Paul would keep on saying, he would write, for, for if we believe, Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep or of, who, who have died in Christ. For this we say by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those 
who have died in Christ. For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a shout, with the, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. You see that? The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel. That means a mighty voice. With the, with the trumpet of God. That means, I believe, his voice will sound like a trumpet, just like John heard in Revelation chapter 1. And then Paul said, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. You see, in verse uh, 17, when Paul wrote those words, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord of the air. See, the word, the word caught up in the English is the Greek word harpazo. And the Greek word harpazo, it literally means to snatch up. To, set, to snatch up suddenly, to snatch up with, with great force, to take away suddenly with great force. That's the word harpazo mean, means. And the word, harpa, the, the word harpazo, the Latin word for that is the Latin word rap, rapir or rapturo from which we get the English word rapture from. You see, that's just some, that's where we get the English word rapture from the from the words caught up. And again, the, rap, the word rapture means to, to snatch away, to, 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 to take away. And, and Jesus, and, or Paul described it, that that's going to happen when the Lord comes. He said in verse 15 that, he said, I say by the word of the Lord that, he, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who have, who have died in Christ. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. See, that's what the rapture is, the physical, literal coming of Jesus. But from what we can tell in this passage, at the rapture, when we're caught up, Christ is only going to come as far as the clouds. And there's no indication that the world is going to see it. It's going to happen, and we are going, and all those who are in Christ, as Paul wrote it, all those who have died in Christ years ago, even Old Testament saints, all those who have died in Christ, they're going to be caught up first, and we will meet the Lord in the air. You see, it's going to happen as Paul would describe in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to, I'm going to read it in just a moment, but it's going to happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. And, and Paul would write that, that we can comfort one another with these words. You see, the, the, the rapture, the catching up of believers to meet the Lord in the air when Christ comes for us is a comforting word. It's a word of comfort that this world is not our home, that that heaven is our home, as Paul would describe in Philipp in the book of Philippians, that that we that uh, uh, that we are citizens of heaven. And it's a comforting word that Jesus Jesus is coming back for us. I know the world makes fun of it, and there are even those some in the church that even make fun of it. But you know, Peter would write that that in the last days that that scoffers would come and and actually uh, scoff at the coming of the Lord, saying, where is his coming? And there are those today that scoff at the coming of Jesus, and they say, where is he? He hasn't come yet. And that was in the first century, and that's even in our day today. But you know what? As children of God, we can know this based on God's word. Jesus Christ is coming again. And not only is he coming again, but he is coming soon. And he's coming for you and I as believers. And you know, the, 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 the thought here uh, of, I'm going to uh, present this thought of who is going in the rapture. You know, Paul answered that question in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 14. When he said this, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him 
those who have died in Christ. You see, what's the criteria for going in the rapture, for being taken away? It's that we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Paul put it that simply. And we understand from balancing out Scripture with Scripture that, that we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. We believe that He's the God-man, that He is God in the flesh, as, as for, uh, John chapter 1 describes that he's God, that he came, that he died on the cross for our sins. He, he had the perfect birth, lived the perfect life, and he died the perfect death, and he took our sins upon himself so that we could be saved from our sins and saved from eternal separation from God, and we could have eternal life. And we believe that Jesus died, uh, died and he rose again. And Paul said that's the criteria. And, and get this, there is no such thing as a, uh, uh, the rapture for, for believers, you know, who are really, you know, on fire for God. And then, you know, another rapture for those who are not on fire for God or, or you know, those who are not on fire for God, they're going to miss. The, there is no partial rapture. All those who are truly saved, who are truly in Christ Jesus, are going in the rapture. Now, I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And if you, again, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and beginning with verse 50 and reading through verse 55. Because Paul also explains the rapture in this passage and makes some powerful truths known about it. He says this in 1 Corinthians 15 beginning with verse 50, again through 55. He says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's speaking about the heavenly aspect of the kingdom of God, the eternal aspect of the kingdom of God, that flesh and blood cannot inherit it. In other words, we're not going to end up in the heavenly kingdom of God with this body. This body is aging. This body is dying. But God has this plan for every child of God, a resurrected body. Just like Jesus rose from the dead with the resurrected body, God has that plan for every child of God. Hallelujah. A resurrected body in which there is no death, there is no crying, there is no mourning, there is no more pain, there is no effects of sin and of the fall anymore. But as John would write in 1 John chapter 3, Verses 1 and 2, that we don't know what we shall be in the resurrection, but we do know this, that when we see him, that is Jesus, we shall be like him. Hallelujah. Praise him. Well, that gets me excited. But Paul wrote this, Now I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery we shall, and a mystery means a hidden thing. In other words, it's, it's, we're not, we, don't, we don't have an example of the, of the resurrected body in front of us in this life. That's the idea of a mystery. And also the timing of it is a mystery. We don't know exactly when the rapture will take place, but we should be ready for it as if it could happen at any moment. So it, he said, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all die a physical death but we shall all be changed. Hear that? We shall all, all believers, we shall be changed. He said, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Hallelujah. Oh, death, where is your sting? And oh, grave, where is your victory? <laughs> Man, that excites me. I just want to say thank you, Jesus. Because, get this, as a child of God, we have this hope. This is a part of the hope that is in us, Christ within us, the hope of glory, that one day 
we're going to be taken from this earth, whether, again, whether, and we're, and we're going to receive a resurrected body, whether we die a natural death or whether we are raptured, one day we're going to experience a res- and, and have a resurrected body. And death, as Paul wrote, death will be swallowed up in victory. Whose victory? Christ's victory at the cross. And he said, oh, death, where is your sting? You see, death, physical death, and even spiritual death, eternal separation from God forever and ever, it has no power over us as a child of God. You know why? It's because Christ defeated death through his death at the cross. You see, he took it upon himself, and he defeated it. He took the keys of death, hell, and the grave away from Satan. That's described in Revelation chapter 1. He took the keys of death, hell, and the grave away from Satan. And now Jesus has the keys of death and of hell. That means that all who believe in him, they don't have to go to hell. They don't have to experience eternal separation from God forever and ever. And and, and Paul would write again in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 54, death is swallowed up in victory. Verse 55, oh, death, where is your sting? See, death has no power over us as a child of God. And he said, oh, grave or oh, hell, where is your victory? See, the grave and hell, they have no victory over us as a child of God. Why? It's because we're in Christ and Christ took the penalty of our sin upon himself. He took upon himself everything that we that, that we rightfully deserve and Jesus' death satisfied the righteous demands of God. Jesus' death satisfied the wrath of God so you and I wouldn't have to experience the wrath of God. You see, some People believe, some believers believe that, that we as the church, that we're going to go through the seven-year tribulation period. But you know, the Bible very clearly tells us that the seven-year tribulation period is the time of God's wrath, whether it's seven years or three and a half years or three, you know, uh, three quarters of th- seven years, whatever time limit that is. Some teach that we have to experience the wrath of God or that time period of the tribulation to be purified, to be totally consecrated. But you know what? We are purified by the blood of Jesus. And yes, it is true that God uses trials in this lifetime to draw us closer to Christ and to refine our faith and to purify our faith as gold is refined in the furnace. Yes, that is true, that God uses tests. He uses trials. But there's a, there's a huge difference between us as a child of God in this life going through times of testing and, and times of trial, as the writer of Hebrews would explain in Hebrews chapter 12. We go through the tests that we go through in this life the writer of Hebrews would, ex- would explain, and he, again, in Hebrews 12, because God loves us, and God wants us to be uh, uh, closer to him. And even when we go through the hardest times that we go through in our tests and our trials, Paul, or the writer of Hebrews, which I believe is Paul, would explain the beginning of Hebrews chapter 12, that it, all of our hard times, they, they can't even compare to what Jesus went through at the cross. See, God allows us to go through tests and trials because he loves us. And he would say, again, in Hebrews chapter 12, I don't have the specific uh, uh, verses. You can read it, read the whole chapter. It's a great chapter that he allows us to go through those tests and trials. And and it's like an athlete that's going through training. And those who are trained by it uh, Paul said, he said, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness by those who are trained by the trials. But you see, this is my point. There's a huge difference between the trials that we go through in this life and the coming tribulation period as the Bible describes it, as Jesus described it in Matthew chapter 24 
as Jesus described it in Luke chapter 21, as the book of Revelation describes it, what, what, what the world's going through right now with the pandemic of COVID and other things, it is nothing. I mean, I'm not, it, it can't even compare to what's going to happen to this world during the coming, tri coming tribulation period. You see, that time period is described in the Bible in, Re in Revelation chapter 6, verses 16 and 17, as the great day of the wrath of God. I will say it again. In Revelation 6, verses 16 and 17, it's described as the great day of the wrath of God. See, the wrath of God or the, 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 the coming tribulation period is a time period in which God is going to pour out his wrath on this earth. God's going to bring Israel, the nation of Israel, to the point where Israel as a nation, they will finally accept Jesus as their Savior, as their Lamb, and as their Messiah. But it's a time period in which God, God's wrath is going to be poured out on this earth. You just read the book of Revelation, chapters 6 through 19, to read all of what's going to happen to this earth. Again, it's going to be God's wrath poured out on this earth. And the Bible very clearly tells us, and Paul tells us in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9, that God has not appointed us unto wrath, but unto salvation. There's nothing in God's word that tells us that, that church, get ready. Get ready to experience the wrath of God. Embrace yourself for the wrath of God. The Bible nowhere tells us that, but actually tells us just the opposite. Lift up your eyes. Keep your eyes on Jesus because the restrainer, we're going to be taken out. We're going to be taken out of this earth. And that's the rapture of the church. And so today I encourage you, be blessed, be encouraged in your faith. This world's not our home. Jesus Christ is coming again, and he's coming back soon. I encourage you to go to our website, check us out. I encourage you again to, to go to our YouTube channel, Cornell Ministries YouTube channel. I'm teaching a series on the book of Revelation where you can learn more about this. I encourage you to do so. Contact us today. God bless you and have a wonderful day in Jesus. Thanks for joining us today on Cross Life. Pastors Bob and Sharon would love to invite you to visit them at Covenant Church in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Service times are Sunday mornings at 1030 and Tuesday evenings at 7. For more information, be sure to visit CornellMinistries.com. Your gifts of support help make this program possible. Visit CornellMinistries.com slash online giving to donate today. We look forward to seeing you next time right here on Cross Life with Pastors Bob and Sharon Cornell.